Over the last five years, through work and personally, I've used five different laptops as my daily driver. Four of them were MacBook Pros of different sizes, and finally, I had the Microsoft Surface Book 2. Most of the time, I'm using my laptops for pretty low intensity tasks, social media, video streaming, going through emails and things like this. But through my work, both on this channel and outside of YouTube, I also do a lot of video editing as well as programming. When ASUS reached out to me to take a look at the ZenBook 14, I was immediately intrigued by a surprising feature that I hadn't ever seen before in a laptop. And that was a second display in the touchpad. I wanted to know, would this screen actually be useful or is it in the same category as the MacBook Pro's touch bar? The cheapest I found a similar spec ZenBook 14 online was $1,900 Australian as of January 2020, so I'm going to be using this price as my point of comparison. Talking tech specs for a second, the version of the ASUS UX434FL I have supports an 8th generation Whiskey Lake Core i7-8565U processor. This is a 4-core hyper-threaded processor factory clocked at 1.99GHz. This laptop also has 16 gigabytes of memory and both onboard Intel UHD graphics 620 as well as a discrete Nvidia GeForce MX250 graphics chip. Intel now has the 10th generation Core i7 10510U processor, which I can see is in the newer version of this laptop. Display wise, the ZenBook has a touch enabled 14 inch display with the common 1920 by 1080 resolution, coming in for a pretty average 157 pixels per inch. No high DPI screen here. Finally, the whole device measures 31.9cm across, 19.9cm deep and 1.69cm in height. On the connectivity front, the ZenBook has one USB-A port on either side, a USB-C port, a microSD card reader, a headphone microphone combo 3.5mm input, a full-size HDMI display output and finally proprietary DC power input. I love that the ZenBook chooses to retain a full-size HDMI port despite its thin form factor and the full-size USB ports on either side are super convenient. Each of the USB ports runs at the 3.1 10 gigabits per second specification, although I really would have liked to see USB-C port act as a fully featured Thunderbolt 3 port, allowing me to use my external graphics card as well as charge the laptop. I also would have liked to see a full-size SD card reader, as I'll still need to bring around a card reader to import my files from my cameras. But enough of the tech specs, let's talk about what you'd actually use this for. The first scenario is what 99% of people do with their laptops, and that's social media and video streaming. It seems a bit funny to spend $1,900 on a laptop if it's just going to be used for this, but hey, even on my nearly $7,000 daily driver MacBook Pro, I'm not working 24-7. But I digress. Booting into the laptop for the first time, I was a little bit disappointed to find a whole bunch of stuff already installed on the laptop. I understand the laptop has to come with some drivers and some software for the special trackpad, but it also came with a McAfee trial which kept popping up and even tried to install itself into Chrome which I installed myself. The ZenBook also came with a software installed called MyASUS, which I didn't sign up for but really just looks like a way for ASUS to collect information on how I'm using my laptop. I really thought in 2020 that we'd move beyond preloading all this junk software. To even open the laptop, you'll need to use two hands as the magnet holding the screen is pretty strong. Once open, the laptop resumes from sleep in less than a second, or if it was hibernating, it takes about 10 seconds to boot up. Logging in is fairly easy using the IR sensors paired with Windows Hello, although given any adverse lighting conditions or being slightly too far away from the screen causes it not to work. In my experience, I'm able to log in just using my face about 60% of the time. Fortunately, Windows offers a range of other sign-in methods, so using something like a pin, which has only four numbers, isn't too challenging to do. I've recently gotten into watching The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, and so I thought what better way of checking out the media streaming capabilities of this laptop than watching a few episodes of that. Despite the fan kicking in when I opened Google Chrome, it quickly died down and I was able to watch the show with an essentially silent laptop. Picture quality is pretty good on the ZenBook, although the very glossy screen meant I had to ensure that I didn't have any lights on behind me at all. Only at the very extreme left and right viewing angles did the image become hard to see, and so you'll have no problems watching YouTube videos and showing all your friends who are all huddled around the laptop. The small bezels allowed the screen to take up nearly the whole available space, allowing for what ASUS calls the 14-inch display in a 13-inch chassis. There was no obvious backlight bleeding, although when the screen was showing black, you could still see and very clearly tell that the screen was on. There's no OLED technology here. I also would have really liked to see a brighter display, as like I said before, I often found it challenging to use in light conditions. 
I guess not having such a glossy or reflective screen might have alleviated this problem as well. As with any action show, The Mandalorian has very quiet dialogue and very loud blaster noises and explosions. Lying in bed following the ventures of Baby Yoda, I had the volume set to about 60%, allowing me to clearly hear the dialogue without annoying the rest of my family in the house. The dialogue was clear and audible, meaning I had no issues enjoying the show at all. But moving on to listening to music, the Harman Kardon speakers were nothing really to write home about. The speakers are downward facing near the front left and front right of the bottom of the laptop and are very obviously from a laptop. They are fairly loud at full volume, although they sound pretty tinny and muddy and they really lack bass. Comparing the speakers to something like in the MacBook Pro behind me is kind of like comparing a Toyota to a BMW. To suss out the battery, I decided to see how many episodes of The Mandalorian that I could watch in a row. With the brightness set at 50% and with the sound off, I managed to get 5 hours and 14 minutes of watch time in from 100% to the laptop being fully dead, or about one and a half seasons of the show. This smokes my much larger MacBook, so I was pretty happy with the results that I got. Next up, I obviously wanted to jump onto Reddit and chat about The Mandalorian now that I'd watched the season one and a half times. This gave me a pretty good opportunity to test out the chiclet style keyboard. Initially, I found the keys to be a bit mushy, but coming from the MacBook butterfly switches, I think I was being a bit harsh. After spending a little bit more time with them, I actually really ended up uh, with much more accurate typing. There's quite a bit of travel on the keys, but you don't really need to push hard to actually get the key to activate. The keys are fairly quiet, and I was able to get up to my usual 100 words per minute in no time at all. I also liked how the laptop was able to squeeze in 17 keys along the function row at the top, whereas normally you'd only see 13 or 14. The next use case I wanted to test out was how the laptop went with my two main pieces of work, that is video editing and programming. To test out video editing, I fired up Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve and brought in a 4K 60 clip filmed on my Panasonic GH5 in 8-bit color, encoded as H.264. My timeline was set to 3840 by 2160 at 24 frames per second. Running at full resolution with no media optimization, timeline performance was absolutely terrible and I wouldn't recommend anyone to edit like that. Switching over to optimized media improved performance, but there was still a lot of jerking and it wasn't smooth even for a second or two. Finally, dropping the proxy mode down to quarter resolution continued to enhance the playback experience and it actually ran for a few seconds without jittering or dropping any frames. But every now and then, and there were still stutters, and so I wouldn't really like to be doing hours and hours of editing on this machine. Rendering this 1 minute 55 clip to H.264 at 4K24 took 6 minutes and 58 seconds. Moving on to some other tests reflective of my day to day work as a software developer, I downloaded React, which is a JavaScript framework for making interactive websites, and I compiled it, which took 9 minutes and 3 seconds as of January 2020. Heading into Visual Studio Code and the 1080p display was a pleasure to work with, allowing me to easily fit two files side by side with the file explorer open next to that as well, while still being able to read most of the lines of the code files. One thing that was frustrating as I was trying to get some work done was the constant pop-ups from both McAfee telling me that my trial had expired, as well as my ASUS wanting to do various different updates. As I said earlier in this review, I really wish laptops in 2020 didn't come with all this junk software. Jumping into a video call with the 720p webcam and the microphone are acceptable, but nothing really to write home about. The main standout feature of this laptop is the screen in the trackpad. Maybe I haven't really found the right use case yet, but I just never used it. When I first heard of this laptop, I really loved the idea of having a second screen, but still taking up the same form factor as a normal laptop. There are a few apps that help you in Microsoft Office apps, but the main problem in any application you use on this trackpad is the trackpad stops you from using the mouse. On one hand, you could revert to using the touchscreen of the screen and then the trackpad uh, as a screen as well. So essentially doing two different touchscreens, but I don't really know anyone who prefers reaching up to the screen with their fingers as opposed to just using a mouse. Secondly, if I was to go all in on two touchscreens, I'd rather something like the ASUS ZenBook Duo, which has a massive screen, uh, second screen right above the keyboard, as opposed to just behind the trackpad. Even using the touchpad as a second display just for viewing information, as in not interacting with it, is still not really that useful, as your fingers are likely to be over the screen and using the trackpad anyway. Maybe I just haven't found the right use case yet, but as excited as I was to try out this second screen, I really found it more annoying than useful. It often randomly switched back to the apps mode as opposed to being the trackpad, and so I'd often find I'd go to move my mouse or start scrolling or something, and nothing would happen because it was in that apps mode. I ended up just disabling the touchpad altogether and using it solely as a mouse. I can kind of draw comparisons to the MacBook Pro's touch bar at the top where the function keys are, which similarly doesn't really offer anything particularly useful just over those normal function keys. Finally, I thought I'd run through some obligatory Geekbench 5 numbers for comparison's sake. 
For the CPU test, the ZenBook got a single core score of 461 and a multi-core score of 2016. For the GPU test with the discrete NVIDIA MX250 graphics, got an OpenCL score of 8288 and an OpenCL score of 5727 with the onboard Intel graphics 620. In terms of how that translates to real world gaming performance, you'd basically be able to run older or less intensive games such as Minecraft or Rocket League at about medium settings, but don't really expect to run the latest AAA titles at any kind of decent quality or frame rates. Ultimately, the ASUS ZenBook wouldn't really be my first choice if I needed to spend $18 or $1900 on a new computer. While I love the small form factor, the keyboard and the array of connectivity options, the performance for the price just doesn't really stack up. Editing 4K videos wouldn't really be possible, and for this price I know there are plenty of laptops which would handle this task with no problem. The screen in the trackpad adds a lot of unnecessary cost, which I would have rather have seen put into performance or something like a better screen. Honestly, I'd only really recommend this laptop if you were doing relatively light or low intensity work, such as sending emails or writing documents. But seeing as we're in 2020, a lot of these tasks could be done on much more portable and much less expensive tablets, so I'm kind of struggling to find an audience for this laptop. If you enjoyed this video or this helped you on your laptop purchasing quest, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down the bottom in the description or just above the description to Technologetic.